Okay. All right. Thank you all for coming here tonight. I am Scott from the modular company Industrial Music Electronics. I'm here to demonstrate some of our latest and upcoming modules from the Mark III series. A couple months ago, we released the wavetable oscillator, the Piston Honda Mark III. It has quite a lot of upgrades from the previous version. It's now a dual wavetable oscillator with morphing wavetables. It has a much cleaner sound, 16-bit wavetables, unison detune modes, and morphable presets. I'm going to play around a basic patch using this oscillator to demonstrate the capabilities of the module, also hop around the menus a bit. Uh, to explain our patch a little, we have the Piston Honda oscillator going into our Andre Jr. ADSR VCA low pass gate combo. Just a very simple oscillator amplifier patch. CV support is coming from this nice Polish quad LFO and the Stilson Hammer sequencer. But they will only be adding slight articulations to what I'll be demonstrating using my hands. Okay, to start, we're going to listen to some nice basic wavetable modulation. I'm going to return us to a very basic sound here. We'll listen to a single oscillator first. When you go to the main screen, you can see a live view of the waveform that changes as you modulate the wavetable position. Piston Honda's wavetable bank is addressed with three axes, so you may imagine the waveforms as a three-dimensional cube and the point at which you are listening is traveling within that. Within this cube, we have eight different waveform banks. I've created some of the waveforms and artists such as Rodent 516 and Surichai, Blush Response, have created other waveforms. hard to see with the cables in the way, but we also have a micro SD card slot on board so that you may quickly upload your own custom wavetables. There's a nice uh, open source waveform editing program made by the modular company Synthesis Technology that generates files that are natively read by the Piston Honda. So we're going to get into some of the more advanced features here. We're still listening to just a single oscillator. We can go into a menu to access the more advanced options. Each one has a, uh, each oscillator has a unison detune function. can also modulate the uh, octave position. Other than the shared wavetable controls, Piston Honda has two independent voltage controlled oscillators. So now I'm going to plug the mix output in so we'll listen to both oscillators at once. You can hear the additional detuning. The wavetables are shared. In this mode you can see the, uh, the wavetable controls are shared. You can see that right now each oscillator is playing the same waveform. If you use the select buttons to deselect an oscillator, you can set the, you can set the other oscillator to a different wavetable. 
One of the greatest improvements of the Mark III series is the response of the CV inputs. They now respond to the entire range of plus minus 10 volts with a high sampling rate and a very natural behavior. I'm going to turn up the LFOs now so we can hear the effects of this modulation. These are simple sine wave LFOs that are going into the waveform inputs. Make it light, nice and slow. There's a second mode on the piston Honda. Each oscillator can, instead of using the internal VCO, it can address the wavetable from an external input for dynamic wave shaping effects. When this mode is off, the FM input on the oscillator functions more as a uh, through zero frequency modulation, which is normal from the other oscillator. Now we will put it into this dynamic wave shaping mode where the big frequency knob will now control the gain of the external input signal. So for example, we can hit this with an envelope. Let's get some envelopes in here. Both oscillators may be switched into this alternate mode at the same time, or just one if you prefer. So let's go back to the normal mode now. A feature common to all three, all Mark III series industrial music electronics modules is the voltage controlled preset manager. Each module can store eight simple presets that may be recalled by enabling the manager. You can click through them using the rotary encoder. You also have a CV input that's associated with that preset manager. I have it patched into another sine wave LFO. So I'm going to turn up the attenuator, which will cause it to scan through the presets. You can set the preset manager to modify all of the controls on the front panel or everything except for the pitch controls, if you just like to modulate the other sound characteristics. The, uh, the most exciting feature of that is that it also has a morphing mode. So we put it back into the preset morphing mode, turn up the attenuator, and now it will smoothly glide between all the panel states represented in preset memory. So through careful programming in the preset manager using the morph function, you can achieve very highly dimensional changes in the sound with a minimum of patch cables.
so let's turn the modulation off and get back into the normal operating mode. There are some other fun features in the menu, such as the uh, random preset generator. That can also be controlled by using a gate event into the preset input if you make the appropriate menu setting. So, have a break from talking about the Piston Honda, and we'll talk a little bit about Andre Jr. here on the end of the case, which is my output module. It's not yet released. I've been threatening to do so for maybe a year now, but the, uh, the engineering has been completed. There's a lot of fine-tuning of the analog circuit. Andre Jr. is a double ADSR module with a single channel of analog VCA, low-pass gate, low-pass filter. It's switchable between the three modes. So I'm going to take a second to start the sequencer and just play a simple note event that's being gated. Alright, so we have a nice static sound here. Let's pick one with some more harmonics to get filtered out. The specialty of Andre Jr. is the velocity control input. You have a CV input that controls the amount of the envelope that comes out of the outputs and also which controls the VCA filter. So let's modulate that by hand. Now we're going to change to the low pass gate mode. Right now we're listening to just the plain VCA. And now just the low pass filter. It's a simple two pole analog VCF. This large knob on the top that I am occasionally touching is the shape control. So by playing with the envelope times and the, uh, the shape control, which goes from linear to you know logarithmic curve, you can tune in whatever kind of response you'd like out of the filtered modes. So now I'm going to plug the velocity CV back into the sequencer so it can hear what it's like when it's modulated by something like that. Let's go back to low pass gate mode too. We've just finished uh, a huge milestone in the development of our next module, the Hertz Donut Mark III. If you remember the Hertz Donut Mark II, it is a dual digital oscillator with an internal modulation bus. It was inspired by the uh, Buchla 259E complex waveform generator, both in its uh, modulation scheme and its uh, unique wave shapers. So in the Hertz Donut, Mark III, we uh, decided to go for the ease of setting up a complicated modulation algorithm instead of preset things. If you're familiar with uh, the Yamaha DX7 and all of its uh, offspring, 
you have a bunch of simple sine wave operators that are arranged in a fixed algorithm where you have uh, some additive blocks and other operators that modulate the frequency of them. But these are preset, you get a bunch of them in each of the synthesizers and you can only switch between them. And programming an FM synthesizer to get predictable results is a very uh, tedious process. And of course, all that goes out the window when you change your algorithm. With Hertz Donut, we decided to go for a simple three operator scheme where we have a main oscillator going through a wave folder and two modulation operators that can be freely routed to any, uh, any of the parameters by using a simple modulation mixer. So I'm going to start with the simple sound on the Hertz Donut and build up some greater sounds that demonstrate some of the possibilities. So let's get back to a plain, unfiltered sound and plug in the correct oscillator. Okay, now we are listening to a pure sine tone from the Hertz Donut Mark III. I'm going to introduce modulation operator A into its frequency modulation. So the way this works is, the two, this is the main frequency control up here. Unfortunately, I don't have a face plate yet with the labels on it. The two modulation operators are down here. And by default, they are quantized to uh, integer ratios of the master frequency. So whatever harmonic scheme that you set up will follow through all the pitch changes that you make with the, uh, the main oscillator. So right now we're listening to 1-1. One, one. It's going down, dividing the main frequency. And that will multiply up to higher frequencies. And this is simple sine wave on sine wave modulation, getting a very predictable spectrum. The four sliders here represent the modulation mixer. Instead of working with a, a set of complicated operator schemes with four to six or maybe even eight operators, you have to learn how each of them behave. Instead, we can consider the modulation scheme to, in a mixer paradigm. So again, face plate without labels. We have operator A selected. This first slider will modulate the main oscillator frequency. The second slider will modulate the operator B frequency, but we're not using operator B right now. The third slider will, will modulate the wave folder. Modu the modulation slider 4 is freely assignable, so you may pick a destination from the menu, and that is stored as part of the preset. So I'm going to introduce some more frequency modulation with operator A, and now we'll bring in some operator B as well. You push to select, set your modulation ratio, and then the function of the sliders change as each new oscillator is selected. In the complete version of the module, this will be accurately shown on the display, but we're working with very early beta of the firmware right now. Now, instead of needing to select each modulation source one by one to change your modulation scheme, we have a master modulation controller right here. So anything that you program with the uh, mix goes into this modulation scaler at the very end. So it's basically a control for more or less modulation. All of the uh, 
All the mix settings and everything, of course, are stored as part of morphable presets. A lot of the modules that are coming from us, we will be exploring the, uh, the limits of this uh, morphable preset scheme and having a four slot modulation mixer is a sensible next step for using one CV input for greater control. Unfortunately, I don't have the, uh, the presets fully implemented on this early module, but I will continue to demonstrate some of the unique sound properties. Now, in the DX7, you were limited to sine waves. Do uh, you get your harmonic spectra out of uh, carefully modulating the next uh, operator in the chain, or certain algorithms will let you feed back an operator into its own frequency control input for skewing the wave in kind of a sawtooth-like shape. Here, on the Hertz Donut, you can freely select your wave shape. You can continuously fade from sine to triangle, saw, square, all the way back around. You do that through our multifunctional big knob controls here. We're listening to an unmodulated sine wave on the main oscillator right now. So we will hold down the oscillator select button and turn the big knob. It becomes a triangle wave and then a square. A saw, then a square, back to sine. That is also a modulation destination on the mixer for each of the three operators. So let's listen to what it sounds like if you have some or a nice sign on sign FM. Let's just make it so we're listening to operator A right now. So if we change the wave shape of the modulating oscillator, you get some more interesting spectra out of it. And then if you change the wave shape of the primary oscillator, things get even more interesting. As we change the pitch, the uh, harmonic relationship between the uh, carrier and modulator stays similar. Let's go back to sine waves now. The main oscillator of the Hertz Donut Mark III goes through a wave folder. If you're familiar with the Hertz Donut Mark II, it had three different flavors of wave folding. They were identified by color. The orange one was a nice digital process using exclusive OR logic to kind of make fractal features grow out of the waveform, very quickly introducing higher harmonics into the signal. So we're listening to our plain sine wave now. Let's have a listen to that. That's not it. That's not it either. This is it. Of course, it gets pretty interesting if you use the audio rate modulators to modulate that as well. So let's look at slot three on the mixer. There's our modulation. Now we can change the modulation frequency. And just for fun, let's bring modulator B back in to control the actual frequency of the main oscillator. My first synthesizer was a Nordbleed 2, and I really liked the character of its uh, internal through zero FM, and I I took a lot of care to make sure that the Hertz Donuts FM in all of its forms kind of gives me the same feeling. So let's go on to the next wave folder mode. We're back listening to our plain sine wave. Let's move on to the, the green wave shaping mode. Recall how we discussed with the Piston Honda, the alternate mode where you can push an external signal through the wavetable instead of the oscillator. 
the same basic idea applies. You have a uh, you have your selected waveform that gets pushed through a special table. These green and red tables were inspired by the 259E. I'm going to change them a little in the final version of this module so that they're they're a bit more subtle to start. You, you can get more variation in the lower end of the controller. Right now the gain is very high, so it gets harsh very fast as I turn the knob, but it may not resemble this in the final version. That's the green wave shaping table, which is uh, composed of a Chebyshev polynomial. This one also responds really well to triangle waves. So let's go to triangle. You can hear how it kind of takes on a vocal quality. Let's bring in our modulation. The red wave shaping mode works much the same way, but the table is much harsher. More zero crossings, weird discontinuities, etc. And that's just adjusting the gain of the, the wave folder. There's no frequency modulation in the signal. Mode. This is what it sounds like for frequency modulation. Fortunately, the sampling rate of this module is much higher than the earlier versions, so we don't run into the aliasing problems that you normally get when you have that much stuff going on in your wave shaping. I've also added in a bonus fourth mode. If you know the Casio CZ101 synthesizer, it had a very unique way of cheaply making a resonant filter effect. Unfortunately, I feel that the interface of that old synthesizer is compromised. You didn't really have any real-time controls. You could only adjust the parameters by using up and down arrow keys. So you could uh, take some time and program some really nice sounds with it, but the resonant phase distortion filter simulation, in my opinion, is much better with real-time controls like this. So, we're listening to our plain sine wave again. Adjusting the wave folder in the phase distortion mode will introduce a resonant peak. It kind of responds weirdly to the modulation. get rid of the modulation and let's listen to it with the sawtooth wave. In this sense it sounds a lot more like standard oscillator sync. The phase distortion trick is simply using the output of a synced oscillator with a clever windowing function to eliminate discontinuities in the signal to give you the nice little bump effect in the frequency spectrum. Let's go back to our normal orange wave shaping sine wave. That's what it sounds like when we sweep the modulation control. Now with all the, all the work you can put into setting up a modulation mix, you may wonder why everything is choked through the, the single modulation control at the end. Well, I was thinking a lot about early 80s EBM bass lines as I was designing this module. and. I found that the uh, the single modulation input was probably the most appropriate way of getting to those sounds very quickly. So I'm going to patch an envelope into the CV input for this master modulation control. But first, let's get our gated sequence going again. All right, 
so we have this dull sound that is being gated by the envelope VCA. Let's put the modulation envelope in there. There's no filtering going on. There's just uh, the change in the spectrum coming from sweeping the uh, modulation amount with the envelope. This is what it sounds like in the low pass gate mode. You get a little more choking of the high frequencies. <coughs> and now in the filter mode. The Mark III series is a long-awaited redesign of a lot of our most basic ideas. If you use any of our Mark I or II series, you're probably well aware of the unique sonic character of those modules. Re really r aggressive, rough around the edges, but at the same time, unstable in a lovable way. In the Mark III, we've uh, changed our approach a bit so that the modules, at their most basic, may produce more predictable, cleaner sounds, but still with very easy access to sonic extremes. This is uh, facilitated by use of the preset manager. We've been in a situation for where many of our modules have been out of stock for a long time, and the good news is they've been redesigned in the meantime. Hertz Donut and Piston Honda are the first to exhibit this Mark III technology, where the preset manager is central to the idea of making very complicated sounds, the minimum of patch chords, setup time. It's meant to uh, be very quick for setting up for live performance. So the patch doesn't get in the way of the performance. So I suppose I will take some questions about any of the things I've discussed, discussed here. Does anyone have questions? No questions. When will the two models come out? The Piston Honda was soon be restocked. Hertz Donut is nearly finished. It will come out uh, late August, September. And I believe Andre Jr. will come out at the earliest convenience after that. Yes. When I was hitting the the envelope with, the, with modulation, was it the same as a VCA envelope? Yes, it was. The uh, shape and the velocity controls also affect the actual voltage output of the envelope, but that is also normaled to this node, which goes directly into the VCA filter. So you kind of have to play around with the shape and the velocity controls to get, as well as the attenuverter on the module itself, to get the exact feel that you're looking for. But we, uh, we spent quite a lot of time on Andre Jr. to play with the curves that interact between the VCA and the filter modes, as well as how the shape and velocity controls interact with those. And the goal was just to make a relatively inexpensive small module that is purpose-built for making these kind of nice, thwappy, bassy sounds that's uh, suitable in very small systems such as this one. 
Yes. Any other oscillators? <clears throat> as far as using faders, I don't think so. I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that has used uh, sliders to determine modulation amounts. But the, the first two versions of Hertz Donut were you know, expi inspired by the Buchla 259E, as well as the original 259. Those two were really built in the complex oscillator idea. Mark III is kind of a departure because of the more free routing scheme. Sonically, I'd say some of the noise engineering stuff is similar to what the Hertz Donut produces. But as far as the, the interface using sliders and a programmable mixer, I haven't, uh, I haven't found anything like that yet. Well, the pre if you get lost in that module, the presets will be a big help in getting some of the sounds. I also forgot to uh, demonstrate the ease of editing presets on the Piston Honda, so I'll show that quickly. We're listening to our piston again. Let's bring it out of the screensaver. So when we go to our presets, you know, we have these eight slots that we can go between. Say we want to change that wave tail, it's just not fitting in with the rest. Double tap the encoder in the preset mode, and the word editing will come up in the display. In this mode, any control that you touch will write that value back to the preset memory. You can exit editing mode by tapping the encoder again. Now it's in the memory. The idea of this series is to, uh, you know, it only has eight presets. You don't have a complex banking scheme or anything like that, but it's just meant to quickly preserve sounds that you create that you enjoy with these modules, recall them very quickly. And with the CV input, it adds another couple dimensions to the performance of those sounds. Yes. Does the Hertz Donut have eight save slots? Yes, it does. All the Mark III modules start with the, the eight preset slots because I feel that gives the, the best resolution of, like when you're modulating it with CV, you can actually tell what the different presets are, but also hit all the sweet spots in between them if you're morphing. And I just, I don't like surfing like a sea of 128 presets. And since these are small modules, the only couple dozen parameters. It's very quick to just throw up a sound and store it in memory. It's not meant to imitate the preset systems of desktop or keyboard synthesizers. It's more about the facilitation of interesting performance technique. questions from YouTube. Is there a timeline for the release of the Hertz Donut Mark III and the thing that I'm doing with Echo? The uh, Hertz Donut Mark III is uh, nearly complete. We're implementing the, the menus now, just making sure everything's cleared up, cleaned up. Sound synthesis sounds great. It behaves kind of similarly to Piston Honda as far as the user interface goes. I'd say Probably September is the most realistic estimate at this point. It's a matter of uh, getting the production organized at our manufacturer. And in the meantime, the uh, work on the firmware should wrap up. I don't, I'm not expecting any disaster there. As far as the BFF, the, chan the four channel sequencing groove box that I've been working on with Moleco Heavy Industry Corporation. They've just had a, a very successful release of their Manther synthesizer, which is a nice little analog single channel thing that kind of reminds me of some older Roland boxes. The idea with the BFF is to extend this to a four track sequencer, four digital oscillators, 
course, with Unison Detune. I've, uh, this is a collaboration with Moleco where I produce the oscillator board and they, uh, they put it in a box with the, the analog filter and the sequencer. I've set up these oscillators to behave a little bit like Piston Honda Mark III or the upcoming Kermit as well. It's basically a simple scheme where you have uh, 16 wavetables and a line, so you have a single dimension of morphing, unlike the Piston Honda's three. So you can use the envelope to morph through the wavetables like in a percussive way. But the, then there's a second axis of morphing, which is more specialized. It adds uh, more of a distortion character to the output wavetable. I don't know their production timeline for that, but I'm collaborating with their lead engineer to get the thing fully fleshed out. I imagine it wouldn't be too long since the, they already worked through all the kinks of the Manther production, which is a pretty nice synthesizer. So I'd imagine that would be their next big project to get finished. I couldn't say for sure, though. You'd have to ask them. <laughs> yes. Uh, funny names for the modules. Argos Bleak is not a G.I. Joe character. He's actually from Captain Planet. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I, in my personal life, I spend a lot of time exploring the concept of the, the villain or the adversary. And a lot of that comes from consuming media. Certain examples of villains from media are Sometimes they inspire technical aspects of the, the module design. It's hard to explain. There's no Clarence Boddicker yet, but I'm sure there will be someday. Yes, he is. Uh, there's, there's, a, if there's this old uh, Capcom System 1 arcade game called Final Fight that had like this Andre the Giant look-alike character. That's where the mystery of the module name comes from. But the, yeah, there was also an Andre Jr. character in that game. It was like a palette swap with a purple one. They, they had like four or five of them. And the sound program in the game is really good. In fact, the, some of the FM stuff in the arcade version did inspire the way, like the, the curves of the modulation mixer, the Hertz donut, just the way that Hamburg modulates quickly there. Hertz Donut is not a uh, villain character. Actually, Hertz Donut and Piston Honda were inspired by tracks from a, a really nice old industrial techno project called x Sect out of San Francisco. He'd sent me these really nice tracks. Each one was named Piston Honda and Hertz Donut. And so I was listening to a lot of the time, and I decided to name the oscillators after that pair of tracks. Um, I don't know if, th I don't think this artist uses modular gear. I could be wrong. He, produ he produces some really good dark techno under different names now. Did you in the back of the white shirt, did you have a question? Yeah, um. Yes, the preset morph on the Hertz Donut. If you use the CV input or the knob, you may morph between all the saved states of all the controls. Like, so for example, if you have your, your mixer set up, like one of your channels looks like that, if you morph to the next preset, you can imagine it virtually adjusting the levels like that. Now, there are a couple different ways you can approach the preset morph. On the Piston Honda, we have the waves only mode, which will only do the, uh, the sliders, the attenuverters, and the FM knobs. So you can keep the master pitch the same as you go through the presets. You can set it to all parameters mode and also change the frequencies as well, which is nice if you want to uh, sequence pitch by using the preset bank or you know, setting different pedal point drones for performances where you just click to the next one when you want to move on to the next phase. Hertz Donut will be similar where there's, the, there's all the parameters excluding frequency, and then there's the everything else mode. And this will continue throughout the rest of the Mark III series. Okay. 
Are the presets archivable? At the moment, no. We decided against this because the presets themselves are very simple. That once you're familiar with the modular, it would only take a few minutes to recreate a certain kind of sound if you're ignoring your external modulations. It's technically possible on the Mark III modules that do have the micro SD card slot. Hertz Donut does not. But the, we, we omit some convenience features like that because we want to encourage the user to uh, take more risks with their sounds. We don't want to recreate the experience of you know, the numeric keypad preset manager. We want, the, uh, we want to shake the user out of their comfort zone when it comes to storable and recallable sounds and try to introduce the idea of the preset memory to the very live environment of the modular synthesizer. People, what's that? What's the question? Okay. The name of the band that created some nice industrial techno tracks that inspired the Hertz Donut Piston Honda is X Clip Sect. Echo, X Ray, Charlie, India, Papa, Sierra, Echo, Charlie, Tango. I can't remember the name of his current techno project, but I've enjoyed a lot of the stuff I've heard from the guy. His name is Mason. He's a A-plus human being. Yes. As the Mark III series continues, does the preset manager only apply to the oscillators? No. We want to use the preset manager to introduce this idea of performable storability to any module that will carry the preset manager. So of course that takes on a different context if you're, if you say you have a quad LFO module with the same display and similar controls. The idea of using that is quite different from using your tone generating oscillator. And, and also would attract uh, maybe a different kind of users. Like in the in the past, I've had modules like the Time Safari Sampler or the Zorlon Cannon Random Gate Generator. In the early days of the business, users would uh, there would be Time Safari people, and then there would be everyone else. And I think that'll be the the same as I introduce different types of modules with presets. The interface may be the same, but the the situations in which you'd employ the presets obviously would differ with the type of module. Like I'm, I'm doing some, I'm doing an analog compressor right now for my own entertainment that has some preset ability in there, and I think about it in a totally different way than I do, like you know, programming modulation mixes on the Hertz Donut. Yes. Is the Mark II Time Safari still getting a firmware update? Yes, it is. It's uh, pretty much a total rewrite where there's fractional sampling, low noise CV input processing. Basically, um, as with many things in society, we're filing down the sharp corners a little bit for more predictable results. So. If you've ever used a Time Safari, the, if you set the loop sliders in a certain way, they're, they're kind of sweet spots in the slider travel itself, so you sometimes get little clicks in the loop points. The rewrite will uh, dispense with that and give you some more nice sounding control over the uh, extent of your sounds. The, the Time Safari concept itself, the Mark I was inspired by the, the Dopefer sampling module, the A112 very old and very interesting module. We wanted a version of more real-time control. 
but by the time it came to the Mark II, we we wanted something that was more like the uh, Max MSP buffer object. And you know, there's still a lot of life left in the hardware, so we're doing that rewrite of the firmware. And the good news is, whenever this happens, some new Time Safari Mark IIs will be produced and available. I think we'll only do one more run of that, though. We have other bigger ideas for the future. Okay. Can I talk about the Argos Bleak a little bit? Yes. Unfortunately, I don't have one on my rack today. I've uh, taken it out to make room for the Hertz Donut prototype. Argos Bleak is a, it's a very interesting design. Some say it's not yet ready to exist, but it does. It's, I call it the world's most expensive octave switch. It is a four-channel quantizer with two inputs that are calibrated, 12-bit resolution, it fulfills the functions of a slew limiter, sequential switch, chord generator, vibrato, so on. And I don't have an image of the panel available to me, but if you can imagine a 15 HP module, about that big. It has some inputs and outputs on the bottom. You have four columns of knobs. You have a nice big knob for adjusting the octave, then a little fine-tune control, attenuator for the internal vibrato signal, and then a knob for controlling the slew limiter rate. So you have four rows of these, and those correspond to outputs that you're supposed to patch into your oscillators and leave them there. It's meant to sit between your sequence or your keyboard or your modulator or anything. It sits between that and the one volt per octave inputs of your oscillators. So it has two inputs at the bottom. Some people like to put a sequence into one keyboard in the other or a sequence into one and some crazy modulation signal in the other. So for each of the four Argus Bleak output channels, you can enter a nice little programming mode. You have like this primitive version of what eventually became the Mark III preset manager where you use a rotary encoder. Per channel, you can set the semitone offset from the master pitch that the input CV is representing, you know, positive or negative. So you're basically using the four channels to set up a chord. And those, uh, the four offsets as a chord, those can be stored as one of 16 presets that can be CV'd through. You can also select which input you would like to get processed and sent out to whatever output or a combination. You can do an addition or a subtraction of them. And you can also select a, which type of slew limiting you'd like. Right now, there are four different modes in the Argos Bleak, where you have your standard slew rate limiter, where you turn it up and there's kind of a glide or portamento between, you know, discontinuities in the input CV. You can also route this to go after, I mean, before the quantizer for uh, glissando type effects. The third mode is just a simple CV delay, which is a time domain delay. The fourth mode is a nice Commodore 64 style arpeggiator, where the vibrato knob controls the uh, the intervals that the arpeggiator will traverse, and then the slew knob controls the speed. It can go very fast, and I took great care that you could do the Rob Hubbard effects with them. The, uh, <coughs> there are a couple other tricks you can do with it. In the input selection, you can also make the, in the channel inputs read the outputs of the previous channel. So if you do this with all four channels, suddenly you have a closed feedback network of uh, four, you know, what's supposed to be one volt per octave CVs. Now, when you, you set the slew rate to the previously mentioned delay mode, suddenly things get really weird. I have a, a short recording on the Industrial Music Electronics SoundCloud that demonstrates this. There's huge crashing waves of noise skipping across all the octaves, but somehow everything's in tune. But the interesting thing is the processing is just of the, uh, the, the tuned control voltage. 
the oscillator is just doing what it's told. So along the bottom of the Argo Spleek, there are several gate inputs, which I think are the most powerful feature, and which uh, make it not a typical quantizer CV processor. You have the expected quantizer enable input, which is basically a, a sample and hold. If you have nothing plugged into it, any changes that are in the CV input that make it cross over the next note, it will operate as you expect. If you patch a cable into this, nothing will update unless there's a logic high state at this input. So you can either use it so like the quantizer doesn't change unless you're actually playing a key on your keyboard, if you're using the 8 signal for the keyboard, or you can use it for more creative sample and hold type effects. Then there's the input swap input. So if you send a gate into that, it'll look at what, you're, uh, what you have programmed for which input you're reading on each of the four channels, and it'll reverse that. So like if you have input A programmed on channel one, input B on channel two, those will get turned around. And performing that, such as with a key or a force sensing resistor or something, that's a really nice way to take your sequence somewhere else very quickly. There's also an enable input for the, uh, the SLU limiter. I think that's an essential feature in any module that deals with that. My first time I ever tried that was like the old analog system SLU limiter that I liked a lot. Our old King Slender module also has that feature. So overall, it's a, it's a weird, big, expensive, powerful CV processing tool. I think it's, uh, it requires a special kind of user to fully appreciate the, uh, the power that the, the module may have. And I've brought one tonight to be raffled off. What did I plan? F what did I plan for the Argus Bleak? Obviously, it is a very personalized module. It's what I wanted to see in that kind of CV processing. I just wanted something stable that would you know, sit between the CV source and the oscillator. Because of my personal system, I've traded a number of modules with my friends who also build modular synthesizers. So I have a nice little collection of their ideas of how sound should be. I typically collect oscillators from other people instead of processors. And some of them respond to different standards, like their idea of C0 is different from mine. Argo Split can correct that in any kind of mixed manufacturer system. So that was one of the main motivations. But I, it all started for me when I had the vision of just the four rows of knobs where you have these very common functions and you can access them directly. It's a lot of little knobs on a panel. That's why it's so expensive. But for me, it was, uh, again, we're, we're just trying to get away from having a million patch cords getting in the way of everything. I like patching. I like really complicated feedback patching. But for actually getting out there and playing with these things, sometimes I've found the less is more. And I want my designs to offer that kind of reduction to the user if that's their style. I've not had the time to do any performance personally myself for a couple of years, but I guess the equipment exists now. I just wish I had the time to use it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a mode in one of the menus where you can have it, each of the Mark III modules boot up into whatever preset mode you like so you don't have to menu dive as soon as you turn the case on. So if you're actually using the stuff for live performance, you can set it up to obey the preset input right away. Yeah. 
Yeah, if you, there's, a, there's a menu option for how the CV input in attenuator should behave. So I demonstrated to you as a, you know, an attenuator. You know, it multiplies the amount of the CV that's coming in there. There's also a mode where you can do it as a uh, as an offset. So the more you turn the knob, that'll change the preset and that adds to the CV value. Third mode is the triggered offset where this acts as the offset again, but these CV inputs inspect in expecting a trigger or gate input, which will advance the preset count by one each time a new event arrives. And then the fourth one is the triggered random, which will cause the random patch generator to operate on each new gate event that comes into the input. It's over.